Hello all, welcome to 10 Top Tips for Affinity Photo, Volume 2. In this tip, I'm going to show you how to copy layers from one image to another. With Affinity Photo, you can copy single layers or groups of layers from the layer stack of one image into the layer stack of another image. We'll start by creating a HSL. Quick desaturation, I think, like so, and let's create another adjustment. I think we'll create a recolor adjustment. Make everything a bit red. Reduce the saturation. Then reduce the opacity so we have a bit of a reddish tinge. And finally we'll create a brightness and contrast adjustment. And we'll just increase the contrast. There we go. As you can see we now have three adjustments. If I just select all three and turn them off and on just to show the effect. But what if we'd like to apply these adjustments to another image or multiple images? We like these adjustments and want to use them again. It is actually really simple if we just open another image. I think um, this one will do for the test. All we have to do is select our required layers on the source image, like so. Once they are selected, press Ctrl and C. Then just select the tab for the destination image. Then select the layer we want to be affected by the adjustment layers. They will appear above the selected layer and press Ctrl and V. There they are. Turn them off, turn them on. We now have our selected layers from the source image in our new image. Now this doesn't just work with adjustment layers, it works with any layers, including groups, images, anything you like. So for a test, let's select our background image and for a bit of fun, we'll cut out this sheep. Let's go in and using the lasso tool just quickly go around the sheep. That's not fantastic but it'll do so just Control C and Control V to make a copy of the sheep. Now we'll transfer the sheep to the other image. Just make sure we have our sheep layer selected. Then Control C and select the destination image. Select the layer we want it to appear above. I think I'll put it above the background. Then just press Ctrl V and there it is, our sheep layer is copied across. Let's just select move and move the sheep into position. And there we have it, copying layers from one image to another. Excellent! Here's a nice tip for using the clone brush tool. It's actually a couple of handy keyboard shortcuts that you probably don't know about. Start by selecting the clone tool and reducing our size to something more manageable. Now, if we hold Alt and click on our source, our source is set, so we can just paint into the destination area. There we go. But here's quite a nice one. If we go Alt and click to set our source again and then move to another position, you can actually use the left and right arrow keys to rotate the source. Left rotates anti-clockwise, right rotates clockwise. Then we can just draw to clone the image at an angle. Cool. You can quickly and easily clone objects diagonally. Let's just do that again. Select a new source, move to another position, then rotate it down and paint in our vertical selection. Not only can you rotate using keys, but if I select a new source and move over to the a new position, I can not only use the left and right arrow keys to rotate, I can use the up and down arrow keys to shrink or magnify. So let's press up and up and up to make it bigger. And now I can just paint it in at the new larger size. Okay, so let's just Alt and click for another one. And then let's arrow key down for much smaller and draw a little tiny one. Let's do it once more, nice and small, but this time rotated. There we go, we can just keep painting all over the place now. Excellent. Now, if you want to reset these back to normal, just go up to the top menu here and select the rotation and zero it and select the scale and zero that. And that's handy keyboard tips for the 
clone stamp tool. With this tip, I'll show you how to create the teal and orange effect using the color balance adjustment. First of all, let's create a color balance adjustment and we'll put some nice teal into the shadows. Select the shadows. The first thing we do is move the cyan red slider over to cyan, all the way over. You don't need to go all the way over, but for this video, I will. It will really depend on your image. And there we go, as you can see, we already have a teal colour in the shadows. Very nice. Now, if we want to make the teal more green, we just increase the greens on the magenta green slider. Increasing the greens has created a more greeny teal. Now, if we want to make it more blue, bring down the green and increase the blue on the yellow blue slider. Now we have a nice teal colour in the shadows. We have complete control of how blue or green we want that teal to be. For the orange, we just select the highlights. Now to create the orange colour, we will add red and yellow. Move the cyan red all the way to the red and move the yellow blue all the way to the yellow. And there we go, we've created lots of lovely orange in the highlights. And of course, we can also control what type of orange we have. We can make it more red or more yellow. To make it more red, just reduce the amount of yellow, like so. And to make it more yellow, just reduce the amount of red. And that's how we get the orange into the highlights. Now, let's look at the midtones. With the midtones, you have a choice. You could make the midtones more teal or more orange, depending on your image. If you make the midtones more teal, then your shadows and midtones will be teal. Or if you make the midtones more orange, then your Midtones and highlights will be orange. It's just your choice, really. Let's have a look. Let's start by making the midtones more teal, like so, just going halfway. And as you can see, we have teal in the shadows and also more teal in the midtones. Let's try it the other way around. We'll make the midtones more orange. Over we go with the red, and over we go with the yellow. And there we go. Now we have more orange. The orange is in the midtones and in the highlights. And the teal is only in the shadows. And that's how to create orange and teal with colour balance. I think you'll like this neat trick. We can create a dynamic picture in picture effect using the views in Affinity Photo. To do this, all we have to do is select View and New View. Now, as you can see, we have two views, which are completely identical. Now, if we disconnect one of the views, like so, make it float, and then grab the corner to shrink the view down, then we'll just place it over here, then I'll just press Ctrl and 0 to centre the image in the view, like so. Now, if I grab my paintbrush and move my cursor over the original image, like so, you can also see our paintbrush in our new view. It appears in the second view at the same time. And also, if we take the paintbrush over to the second view and move it around, we can see it in our original view. And what's nice about this is that if we just zoom in using control and the mouse wheel, so we just magnify an area of the second view, we can now make changes in the second view. As we draw in our magnified view, they appear in our normal original sized view, which is actually really handy. And if we draw in the original view, it appears in the magnified view. So let's just get rid of those. This actually gives us a really nice tool. If I wanted to get rid of, say, this little cloud over here, for instance, then I can reset my magnified view and then zoom right in on that little cloud using the magnified view. Now I've got a good view of the cloud. And next, all I have to do is just grab the in painting tool and just paint out the cloud. 
And there you go, as you can see, it's disappeared in both views. This is a great tool. You can see the effect it's having on your image at its original size, whilst actually doing the operations on your image in magnified size. I think that's a really cool feature to have. Excellent. Here's a nice quick tip for using selections. It's really a beginner's tip, but everyone has to start somewhere. So if we create a selection, let's say using the rectangular marquee tool, just left click and drag to make the selection like so. Now if we want to make an adjustment, like maybe increase the brightness and contrast of that selection, because we now have a selection, when you do create an adjustment or a live filter, let's just create a brightness and contrast for now, the adjustment or filter will only affect the selected area. There we go. If I increase the brightness and the contrast, you can see it's just affected the selected area. And the great thing is, you can use this multiple times. Whilst the selection is active, any adjustment or filter you use, such as the Gaussian Blur filter, will work just within the selected area, which is very handy. And of course, it works with every selection type. If I select a freehand selection, say, let's create a nice wiggly selection, like so. And then let's create a new adjustment. We'll use Vibrance, no, we'll use HSL. And then we'll just desaturate the whole thing. And as you can see, we have desaturation just in the selected area. If we just deselect and add a new adjustment, I think we'll add a, another brightness and contrast. Because we deselected and have nothing at all selected, it will affect the whole screen. Come to think of it, it's a bit strange. No selection means everything selected. Now when we increase the brightness, it will affect the whole image, like so. What a time for my machine to slow down. There we go. Ah, very nice indeed. And that is using selections with adjustment layers and live filters. In this tip, I'm going to show you how to copy the mask within an adjustment layer into another adjustment layer. So if we create ourselves an adjustment for this image, let's say I want to desaturate the outer parts of the image. For instance, I can select adjustments and choose HSL and bring down the saturation slider to desaturate the image. Let's take it all the way down to zero. But now I just want this desaturation effect to appear around the edges of the image. All I have to do is Select my brush tool here, then make sure I have black selected. I have a nice big soft brush. So now I can paint the desaturation out of this certain area. And as you can see, it's disappearing from the mask of the HSL adjustment. So as you can see, if we turn it off and on, only the outer parts around the boat are affected by the desaturation, which is all well and good and looks very nice. But now say I want to also decrease the brightness of the same areas that I previously desaturated. Using a brightness contrast adjustment, I can decrease the brightness, but it affects the whole image. It's decreased the brightness in the extremities, but also over the boat itself, which is not what I want. If we have a look, the boat is getting darker too. This area here is also affected. But there's a way to tackle this. All we have to do, the easiest way that I know, there may be other ways, if we select our HSL layer and then choose select and selection from layer, now we have a selection of the mask from the HSL adjustment. And of course the selection is active. Now all we have to do to create a new layer which is the same as the mask contained within the HSL adjustment, a copy of the mask, if you like, is to go up to Layer and New Mask Layer. And as we can see, it will create a copy 
of the inbuilt HSL mask as a mask, a new mask. Then all we have to do is to grab it and copy it over the brightness contrast layer. So now the brightness contrast adjustment now has the same mask as the HSL adjustment. Let's just turn the selection off and if we toggle this mask, we're only getting the darkening from the brightness contrast adjustment on the edges. Turn it off, it affects the whole screen, turn it back on again and it doesn't affect the boat because we've copied the mask from the HSL to add brightness and contrast. Very nice. Here's a neat trick. We can actually select colours outside of the Affinity Photo window. Let's just select the paintbrush and as you can see at the moment I have a light blue colour. If I press Alt and click on the green area here then I will have a green brush. But here's a nice little trick. If I just expose a part of the desktop and then press Alt and then press down with my left mouse button to start the selection. When I move my mouse over the desktop, it's still selecting the colours. And then when I release my mouse button over a colour, say this magenta, then my brush is now magenta. Excellent. And this also works with the standard colour picker. I select the colour picker and if I click within the image and maybe select this blue, then you'll see I have blue selected. If I switch to my paintbrush, you can see I definitely have blue selected. There we go. If I select the colour picker again, and if I select using the left mouse button and then drag out of the window, I can now select a colour from the desktop like this orange. If I switch back to the brush, then I can paint with the orange that I picked up from the desktop. What an excellent little trick this is. You could have anything on your desktop, such as another image, so that you can grab reference colours or documents, anything you like. Fantastic. I think that is a really, really neat little trick. In this tip, I'll show you how to create a nice coloured vignette rather than the straight, dark or light vignette. So with our image layer selected, in the menu we select layer and new fill layer. And there it is, our new fill layer. For now we'll leave the colour as it is. To start off with, then all we do is, with our fill layer selected, hit this icon to create a mask. And with our mask selected, go over to the tools and select gradient and set the type to elliptical. Just go to the center of the screen like so and drag out. And there we have our elliptical gradient. Then select the center color point. Then up on the color palette, select black. And what that has done is make the mask in the center there darker, which would be more transparent. So in the center, we have our flowers showing through. Now, if we select the outer color point, and in the colour palette set it to white. There we go, we have a coloured vignette. And we can use this little handle to move the vignette closer to the outside. Beautiful. I'll just select the hand tool to hide the lines. And the great thing is, if we select the fill layer, now we can change the colour. In the colour palette here, we can set it to anything we like. Maybe light blue, or dark blue, or purple, red green. We can quickly set it to our preferred colour, so let's set a nice uh, darkish green. And we also have control over the impact, so if we go to our opacity on the layer, we can lower it or higher it and just set it to anything we want. And I'm still not happy with that colour, but we can go across and change the colour again. We have complete control. I think that's nice. And that's how we make a beautiful, controllable, coloured vignette with Affinity Photo.
In this tip, I'm going to show you how to use gradients on adjustments and filters. Let's get started. Let's create ourselves an adjustment. I think a brightness and contrast. Let's bring down the brightness. And of course, this dims the whole image. But if we click our gradient tool, and I think we'll select the radial gradient click in the center of the screen and drag the radial gradient out now you can see we have a radial gradient which has been drawn on the brightness and contrast adjustment layer so if we select this color point here and then set this color to black in the color palette and then we set the other color point to white on the palette. As you can see now, we're getting no darkening at the center, fading into dark around the edges. We've effectively created a simple vignette using a brightness and contrast adjustment and a radial gradient. The radial gradient has actually been applied to the adjustment layer mask, a radial gradient on top of a brightness and contrast. The gradients also work with live filters. So let's create something quite nice by selecting a live filter and Gaussian blur. Check preserve alpha, then increase the amount on the Gaussian blur. That looks good. Now let's apply to this Gaussian blur filter a nice a linear gradient. Pick our spot, I think I'll start here and stretch it to about here. Then on the color palette, set the bottom point to black and set the top color point to white. Then if we grab our paintbrush, making sure we have black selected. As you can see here, we already have our gradient on the Gaussian blur filter and the black at the bottom is causing no effect like so. And the white at the top is causing full effect we can use our black paintbrush to place black onto the adjustment layer mask and so erase the blur effect from the areas we paint. So paint, 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 make the brush smaller, all around the edges and the legs, around the face and the ears, along the back of the little doggy. Smaller brush for the fine details, here we go. I'm doing a rough job here for demonstration purposes, of course, you could take your time to produce a very tidy effect. And there we go, it's a bit crude, but as you can see, using a Gaussian blur filter and a linear gradient, we have a depth of field effect. Not bad at all. In this tip, I'm going to explain the difference between the shadows and highlights adjustment here and the shadows and highlights filter here. Let's start by creating one of each. First, a shadows and highlights adjustment and then a shadows and highlights filter. Let's start with the shadows and highlights adjustment and starting with the shadows, if we raise the shadows, then as we do, we can see that the shadows are lightened in all of the dark areas, including the blacks. Raising the shadows here has the effect of lifting the darker colors and making them all lighter. If we move over to the highlights, as we reduce them, like so. You can see that it has the effect as you can see here. Let's just show you that again. Reduce the highlights. It has the effect of bringing down the brightness of the very brighter colors in the image. Reducing these brighter colors, bringing down the highlights like this with the shadows highlights adjustment is very good for reducing shine or just neutralizing that very, very bright color. It may be your image is just a little too bright and you just want to cap it, this is what you'd use. And also the shadows for capping the bottom end of the dark colors. Now, if we switch that off and move over to the shadows highlights filter, this one works somewhat differently. The filter will bring up the shadows whilst protecting the blacks or bring down the highlights or lighter colors whilst protecting the whites. 
We'll take a look at this in action by just zooming in like so. Now if I bring down the highlights by increasing the highlight strength, as you can see it has the effect of just zoom back out again, reducing the highlights but leaving the whites as they are. Let's just demonstrate that again, bring up the highlight strength and as you can see here the whites are isolated which has the effect of enhancing highlight detail and the shadows works the same but in reverse. If we increase the shadow strength like so it will bring up the darker colours but leave the blacks alone, they are protected. So it has the effect of bringing out shadow detail from an image. So that's the basic difference. The shadows highlights adjustment is used to bring up the shadows or bring down the highlights and the filter is used to enhance shadow detail or highlight detail. In this bonus tip I'm going to show you a couple of reasons, just two reasons, why I think that Capture One is the perfect partner for Affinity Photo. For me at least, Capture One is by far the best RAW processor out there. The first reason is just the speed at which Capture One opens Affinity Photo files. Let's take a look. Right click on a file, edit with, Affinity Photo, I've got TIFF 16-bit etc selected, click open, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. That took around 6 seconds, absolutely incredible. And these are not small files, they're 24 megabit raw converting to 16-bit TIFF. And now I can do all my advanced editing, object removal, everything I need to. OK, let's exit back to Capture One. And I'll show you the second of many reasons why I think Capture One is the best RAW editor. So if I'm scrolling through all my images like so, and let's say I'm on this image and I want to change the exposure, which is really responsive, then when I go to another image, it is instant. Moving from one image to another image is absolutely instant. No waiting. I don't have to wait for it to populate or do whatever the other editors need to do. It's instant. I can whiz through photographs one after the other, just selecting at my heart's content. I can just move from image to image, instantly editing. This speed and fluidity makes Capture One just such a pleasure to use, especially when you've got a lot of images to edit and every second counts. If you enjoyed this video or found it useful, then please consider subscribing. All you have to do is click on the lovely image on the left to subscribe. And maybe even consider giving this video a nice big thumbs up.